This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Want Instagrammers and YouTubers to mention your brand? Or do you want to influence an audience to buy your product? I'm Jason Falls, author of the book, Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand. In this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate the difference between using influencers and actually influencing. Welcome to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. We've been spending some time on the show of late talking about the future of the creator economy and how influencers can plan for monetization either with or without the big social networks where much of their audience may lie today. Two episodes ago, we talked to Ramiro Canavas from Fanbase, which is a lot like OnlyFans, only without the stigma of everyone there being adult content creators. Be sure to go back and listen to that episode as it makes a case for the owned content overall. This week, we're going to dig into the concept of owning both your channel and your audience a bit deeper with PJ Limegrouper. He's the co-founder of the Clash app. No, not an app that allows you to listen to London calling and rock the Casbah. Clash app is an owned content app that allows video creators to not only engage with their core fans and subscribers, but allows those subscribers to post drops. Those are cash payments, tips, if you will, to those creators for their content. The discussion made me think of the old blogger tip jars, but with a more defined purpose and a community of people conditioned to send them. So today we're hearing more about whether or not fan-funded content creators can go beyond just a subscription model. How does that future stack up from a creator monetization standpoint? And is Clash App a method you as an influencer can use to generate income? Do these platforms hold any relevance for brands as well? Well, sure, if the influencer has a big audience there. But we get into that and how the creator economy payment structure is flawed with PJ. I think you'll appreciate his expertise and perspective. Before we get to that, let's take a moment to thank our presenting sponsor, Tagger. It is a complete influencer marketing software suite that allows you to find, connect, and collaborate with influencers, execute campaigns, and measure success. But as you know, I'd rather get some insight and intel from Tagger's customers about how they use the platform and influence marketing, rather than just read off some highlights of the product. I recently caught up with Alexandra Walsh at 3-Day Blinds. They provide consulting and products in the premium custom window treatments category. Alexandra and I chatted about how she uses Tagger, we got into a relatively new feature of Tagger, which is called Tagger Sync. Tell us a little bit more about Tagger Sync. As I understand it, this is a place where an influencer can come. They can basically authenticate through the program. You get a notification that says this person wants to work with you and then you can approve it. So there's no form. There's no craziness for the influencer to do. What do you see on your end? Our Tagger rep that we work with, he sends us an Excel sheet showing all of the information So then we can kind of go in, deep dive into that, look at the images, again, go to their profile, check them out. And I work with my manager on that as a team to, and then from there, we message the influencers on Tagger, very easy. And we just message them asking if they want to set up a meeting with us and move from there. Thanks to Alexandra and 3-Day Blinds for sharing their use of Tagger to learn more and get a demo to see if Tagger is right for you. Just visit jason.online slash Tagger today. That's jason.online slash tagger. What's wrong with influencer marketing's current monetization structures for content creators? PJ Leingruber of Clash App is next on Winfluence. Hello, I'm Ian Truscott here to tell you about Rockstar CMO FM. The M is the marketing and the F... It's a well you decide. As you wonder, does the world need another effing marketing podcast? Find out as every week I chat with friends old and new that I've met through my career from techie to CMO and share a tune, a cocktail and their marketing street knowledge. Just drop a dime into your podcasting jukebox and jive along with Rockstar CMO FM. PJ, we often start with a level set so the audience kind of understands your perspective on influence marketing before we get into the depths of the conversation. So kind of take us through your emergence as a creator first. How did you find yourself creating social media content? 
So, um, so it's, it's actually funny. I've been immersed in the creator space now since 2013. Um, I founded my, my first influencer marketing agency called near reach, uh, back in those days. And that's really when influencer marketing, um, was, was really in its infancy. Funny enough, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of creators. I've helped and assisted a lot of creators. I myself have never been, uh, much of a content creator as an individual. Um, so it, it is kind of weird, you know, I've tried and it really makes me appreciate the difficulty to be a creator, to be funny, uh, to edit, to have good comedic timing, to be just generally interesting. I can do none of those things. <laughs> well, you're probably selling yourself a little short, but I, I do get it. I look at some of the, some of the content that I see from the people that I follow online. And I'm amazed at how, uh, how natural and how easy it seems to come to them. So I'm right there with you. Now, I, you you got into the, the the influencer space, but you have a degree in molecular biology. How does that make sense or does it? Um, there, there actually, there's, there's, there's no, uh, there's no crazy <laughs> affiliation there. Um, so funny, funny enough, I was, uh, I was studying science and <clears throat> I had a, a little side project uh, that I was working on where I was, uh, working in the, really working in the, uh, the festival vending space. I was selling, uh, selling hats at, at uh, as a mer- festival merchandiser. I would travel around at different music festivals as a product vendor and sell items. And, um, we, my brother and I, at the time, we tried to move the business online and, um, initially completely failed because obviously knew nothing about marketing and have a background in marketing, uh, SEO, AdWords, none, none of that. And, um, and through some trials and tribulations, we found some early success with SEO. And we found that we had a, a product that was kind of funny and unique and uh, people were taking to Google to find it. And we, we matched what the searchers wanted and was able to build, uh, build an e-commerce business that, not, not huge, but it scaled to, I think, at its peak around you know, maybe twenty to $30,000 a month in sales. And this was all while I was, you know, in my last year uh, as a student. So I decided um, to take a, you know, to take a pause after school and work on my e-commerce business. And I immersed myself learning all things digital marketing, SEO, email lists, um, you know, the whole e-commerce supply chain. And I really did it all through, uh, through just doing it poorly for a while and learning from my mistakes and, you know, Googling things and YouTubing things uh, to fill in the gaps. And um, I said that I was on a gap year for, you know, before applying to medical school and that was in 2011. So I'm, you know, 10 years into that gap year still. <laughs> nice. Well, you know, at least you're, uh, at least you're paying the bills. If you were on a 10 year, 11 year gap year and your parents were still footing the bill for things, it'd probably be a different story, I would imagine. So I, I know that, you, that when you first sort of came to the influence marketing space, that I think was when Vine was sort of the you know, sort of emerging platform, the big deal at the time. And I think when you, as I understand it, when Vine shut down, it, it, it sort of led you to see a problem in the in the space. And I love the way you put this. You were audience rich then, but revenue poor. Where did that revelation take you next? Yeah. So, so very interesting. So when I started working, when I started working, um, you know, with influencers and I'll get back to your question, when I started working with influencers, it was really through a much different lens. Everything that, everything that I had done in my career up to that point was, uh, about, you know, optimizing the most views possible, the lowest cost per click, uh, you know, the best marketing performance. And I had experimented working with some creators, you know, prior to, to founding my first company, in the space, and I found that it was just such a massive arbitrage uh, versus all the traditional types of uh, ways to generate traffic. You know, maybe apart from SEO, and um, there wasn't any way to scale that. There was no influencer marketing companies. There wasn't any platforms for it. I think you know, clout was out, and that was really about it. There was really much attempt to even quantify that. And the space was primarily centered around blogger marketing, um, and YouTube was really just coming into fruition. And, um, and when Vine, you know, really emerged, I think what Vine did that was very interesting is, is it, uh, it minted a whole new generation of creators that weren't, uh, of the, 
of the same lineage as like as the traditional bloggers and the traditional long form content creators really just enabled people to you know to open up their phone and sh- and shoot content and it's, it's at that time I met my co founder Brendan um, who was a Viner and. Um, you know, we we at at my company Near Each were interested in working with uh, our brand partners. Were very interested in, in getting on Vine and working with Viners. They found you know these guys to be you know incredibly funny and incredibly savvy. And uh, brands were looking for ways to tap into that. And Brendan was one of the the first Viners that we worked with. And he's actually was a was an OG Viner, so he was one of the in the sort of the first crop of, of Viners to get really popular. And, um, and that's actually how we came to work together because it was very difficult for him to, to monetize that content regularly. He was certainly getting brand deal offers here and there. They were trickling in, uh, but he was the one that coined the phrase, um, you know, audience, you know, audience rich and, uh, you know, and, and money poor, dollar poor. Um, so Brendan actually uh, came on to near each as, as a, as a creative creator advisor and really helped us uh, understand the way that we can work with creators, really get get into the mindset of the creators. Um, and, and the biggest thing was illustrate firsthand the problems that uh, that working creators were facing in the space. Um, and then obviously that that time together was instrumental because we we went on to do uh, many great things together since then. Well, we're, we're going to get to the, the, the latest great thing here in just a second, but I, I want to stay at Neo Reach for just a second because you guys were – you know, basically connecting brands with creators and helping the creators build out monetization. But I think you still didn't think the system was as good as it could be. Um, what's wrong with the way creator funds and monetization currently works? I'll approach this question from two lenses. I'll, I'll approach it from the tr- sort of traditional creator monetization. And then and then we could talk about the ways that it's changing. So traditionally, the, the avenues for creator monetization were... Um, you know, the, the ad revenue share channels, like from YouTube, like from, from, you know, from ads on the channel, um, they were merchandise. So creators creating and selling their own merchandise creators and creating and selling, uh, their own ticketed events, you know, doing other things, uh, like that, um, or working with brands, doing brand partnerships. So sponsored posts, you know, brand, you know, some type, types of brand integration, product collaboration, unboxings, all those types of things. And that was sort of, uh, and really still is a lot of the the, the ways that, that creators primarily monetize. The problem is, is it precludes a vast majority of the creators because for creators to be considered brand friendly, especially when you're working with, you know, with top tier ad agencies and, and, you know, big fortune 500 brands, the level of approval is really tight, you know, so these guys will go and they'll scan all the content. And if there's any profanity or any opinions, views, um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll deem that creator not brand friendly and that creator, you know, will have a, a hard time getting brand deals. So it's really forced creators to box themselves in to say, okay, I'm going to either create the content that, uh, I really like, and that I really want to create and that my audience wants to see, or I'm going to go down the route of being more brand friendly, um, and creating, you know, more brand friendly content so I can monetize better and monetize easier as that's changed and evolved. With the, with the growth platforms like TikTok and Instagram, we see the creators that uh, are really pigeonholed to volume. So they're really thinking about, I need to keep creating content so I don't fall out of favor with the algorithm. I need to um, you know, post a video and if it doesn't do well in the first hour, delete it um, because it de- didn't get picked up by the algorithm. And everything is, is centered around, uh, around volume and growth. And the, the mindset of the creator is, is how do I keep growing and how do I grow my audience and how do I uh, you know, how do I remain brand friendly? So there's a lot of things that the creator themselves have to have to juggle as opposed to just being able to say, hey, I just want to be myself and I want to make it work. I want to make a living off of just solely being myself. Um, and that's the shift that we're, you know, we're looking to uh, to build toward and we're, we have been building toward and we're looking to, you know, to see into 2022 as well. So one, one fear that I have for creators in this, you know, new, you know, sort of forming formulation of the new creator economy is that the creator funds, uh, you know, that, that, that the TikToks and the Twitters and the Facebooks and Instagrams of the world are formulating now. And they're trying to obviously, you know, put their talents into the, you know, getting a transaction fee to connect the brands with the creators and all that kind of stuff. I really worry about that because uh, my thoughts there are actually informed by my time at Cafe Press, which is a custom products company, 
Um, I was there for a couple of years and it was built on the backs of creators. Designers uploaded their art to the platform. Then the public bought products with those designs on them. Now, when Cafe Press started, much like the time we're in now with these creator funds and efforts to lure influencers to these platforms, Cafe Press was paying something like 20% commission on anything sold. Well, by the time I got to Cafe Press, the commissions were in the high single digits at best. So I knew a couple of creators who actually saw their income drop by hundreds of thousands of dollars in four or five years. Now, I worry that the TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter creator funds are going to do the same thing. Five, 10 years from now, influencers that are paid, you know, two to three thousand dollars per engagement will be making three or four hundred dollars per engagement. Does that risk ring too true from your perspective? I, I think it does. And I think largely those, you know, the, the purpose of those creator funds are to keep the creators there. Um, you know, and with, without being too controversial, they're really there to serve, they're there to serve the brands, right? They're there to serve the, the, the companies themselves because they want to make sure that they're, uh, they're top tier creators, the creators that are driving the most downloads and driving the most engagements, um, don't leave and go or go, you know, or go anywhere else. So it's sort of go, comes back to the, the initial problem is that the, the top tier creator doesn't have a monetization problem largely. Right. That we're talking like the top, you know, one percent, half a percent. Um, it's the rest of the ninety nine percent that 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 have a little bit of difficulty. And I, I still don't know if the creator funds uh, are, are solving the problem for the mid tail and the long tail. That's true. That's another another thing to watch out for. So, OK, let's get into uh, Clash app, which is your solution uh, for a lot of these problems uh, or knowing most entrepreneurs, your first solution to the problem. Um, I want I want you to tell me what the app does, but I'm curious if the creation of it was either inspired by or at least fueled by the notion that creators are running huge risks by having all their content and their audiences on someone else's platform. When Instagram has a data issue one day, creators are SOL. When OnlyFans decides to eliminate adult accounts, which they reversed the decision on, of course, but those creators you know, approve of their content or not, they're without a revenue source. Did, did any of that have anything to do with uh, uh, Clash's creation? Not that, not that issue particularly. I think the thing that really led to, uh, you know, led to, to Clash was, uh, my co-founder and I, uh, you know, through near each prior to founding Clash were, were brought on, uh, by ByteDance to facilitate the launch of TikTok. And uh, our primary responsibility was to bring in top tier creators and get them onto TikTok, get them posting on TikTok. And they had a very, very large budget to do this. And, you know, we were one, we were one of the first agencies contacted uh, as a partner with them. They had, you know, they've since gone out and, you know, contacted many, many more. But um, the issue was, is that the creators actually hated TikTok in the beginning. It was, it was like twisting an arm to get them to uh, you know, to get them to to join, but it really, it didn't, it, it was a, gr- it is a great platform in terms of, you know, for creator discovery, for minting new creators, it's everybody's on there. Um, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't solve any, it, it's the same problems that existed on Vine and that exist on YouTube and exists on Instagram, um, still exist on TikTok in many ways, they've been amplified in the wrong direction. So I think the thing that we we always were thinking about is, you know, what is the what does the future of creator monetization look like? And, you know, we were we would always look to companies like Cameo, uh, Patreon, Twitch, you know, that have really enabled new monetization channels for creators. And it was always our belief that that was the you know, that was really the big uh, the big thing that we could build at clash the big thing that we really wanted to support so um it really comes down to you know like to to enabling fan support so a couple pillars of things that we're think we were thinking about building clash is one is how as a creator can you start to build more meaningful relationships with your fans right and really seg it's about audience segmentation so um how does a creator get to know their top supporters more and create better connections um so what is a what's the difference with you know you have a million followers on tiktok that's great um you know maybe 500 or a thousand of those followers actually buy your merch, they show up to your live shows, they they join your live streams on Twitch, you know, they're really following you on every single channel. Well, how do you segment uh, the ride or die fans from the from the traditional fans? So that was one thing that was really important to us was building a platform that's focused on strength of audience and not size of audience. 
the next one was monetization. Um, you know, whereas, it, whereas, you know, rather than, than creators be beholden to, you know, to ad share revenue or brand deals, um, you know, these, these fans, they want to pay, they want to pay and support the creator. And we've seen this with the emergence of things like creators putting their Venmo in their, uh, their TikTok bio or their cash app in their TikTok bio, um, and, you know, we, should, we thought we should productize that. So those are really the two, uh, the two founding problems that we were thinking about, you know, with Clash and, you know, sort of going back and looking at how great of a job Patreon has done for, for the YouTubers and the podcasters, um, just enabling fan support, right? And there's some, you know, bonuses or perks you can get if you, if you, you know, support somebody on Patreon, but generally speaking it's it's fan supported right the the creators that are that that are on patreon are being supported directly from their fans well what does that look like for the short form video generation what does that look like for the tiktok and instagram generation if patreon was uh was not founded in 2012 or 2011 or ever it was founded and it was it was built today for today's market what would that look like and that was a lot of the uh the, the questions that we had in mind as we as we began our journey in building clash so you want to make more full-time creators. Uh, give us a little bit more, you know, sort of granular detail on how Clash makes that happen. So we we do a few things. So number one is we enable uh, creators to be supported directly from their fans through an in-app, uh, an in-app digital good that we've built called Drops. Um, and it's really about breaking down the barriers to entry. Everyone on Clash is a creator. Um, everyone can immediately start earning. And on the creator's end, we make it easy. And on the fans' end, we make supporting feasible and intuitive. So it's it's so drops are essentially microtransactions, uh, and they start at, uh, at at twenty basically basically the U.S. dollar equivalent of twenty five cents. Um, and there's no paywalled experience to view content. So the creators can go on there. They upload. Uh, upload videos uh, as you know through our video ed- you know through our, our video creation tools, or they can upload their own videos on there. And uh, and the, for the fans, they can support that they can support that creator by giving them drops. We've also built uh, another feature called fan mail, which is uh, which is essentially a drop with a DM attached to it that goes directly to the creator's inbox. So if you want to send your favorite creator a message, uh, it's very hard to stand out in the comments on TikTok. You can send uh, a drop with a DM attached to it that's called fan mail, uh, and it goes right to the creator's inbox. Uh, we've also we're also building uh, something called subscriptions. So creators, uh, so if you're a fan of a creator and you just want to just support, maybe not give each individual video um, in, in the early part of 2022, we're enabling subscriptions. Um, so you can just subscribe to your favorite creator. Again, it's not a paywalled experience. You don't, uh, you don't unlock or, or, or do or get anything different by subscribing. It's just simply, uh, simply a way of, of, uh, of us showing the, of the fan showing the creator, they support them. And we're building a ton of tools centered around uh, what we call fan score. So we really want to, we really want the creator. We really want to gamify uh, and show the creator who their top fans are. And it's not only about how much uh, support they send, but how many videos they're viewing, how many videos they're commenting on. Um, And we really want to create that, uh, make that data known for the, for the, for the creator to say, Hey, these are the people, these are your true ride or dies. These are the people that are, are truly supporting you. And uh, a, hall- a hallmark feature that uh, that you know that's currently in development now uh, is something called huddles, which is uh, basically it's the creator's private group. So kind of think about it uh, like a like a Discord or a private chat uh, for creators. It's invite only, so the creators will uh, they'll get a list of who their top fans are and who their uh, who their top or who their top supporters are, and they'll be able to uh, to create their own uh, their own personal space on the app just for them, just for their their ride or die fans. Because we we believe that you know for for a creator that needs to monetize, they shouldn't really need, they shouldn't have to worry about you know creator burnout or how much are they, how much or how frequently are they posting or is the algorithm picking up my video? Just segment the audience that likes you the best that you've worked so hard to build on other platforms and just make content for them build relationships with those fans and those fans will be the one to support you. So I assume this experience then is kind of exclusive to the clash app. This isn't like you're, you know, you're posting there, the creators posting all of their social media content and it pulls it in. It's really the, the users have to go to clash app to experience this. Is that accurate? Correct. Correct. Okay. Very good. So what are some, uh, you got some success stories out there that you can share with us to kind of illustrate the possibilities for people? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so we have, uh, we have one creator, um, his name's Ferret Daddy and he raises, uh, he raises ferrets and, uh, on, on his house and on his property. 
and um, and through Clash, he's been able to uh, to to build um, like uh, <laughs> I don't even know what you'd call it. Uh, build new things for his ferrets and it's all all 100 fan supported um and uh, he posts his ferret videos on the app he's got a great community a great community of followers that follow him and support him um and we've seen you know we, the funny thing is is we've seen so many different niches of creators that have had you know that have great success we've had some comedy creators we have uh you know, asmr creators um so they're not just your you know your traditional um you know creators that you see on TikTok, they're, they're in these, um, uh, crazy niches, these oddball niches and, and they're, they're finding success and it's working really, really well. So, um, I wonder, you know, obviously we, we started out the conversation by really, you know, talking about how neither you nor I necessarily, um, you know, identify ourselves as really good creators, but I wonder in a, a situation where you're asking your fans to, you know, give you a drop or subscribe to your content or pay to actually have this content. What do you, what have you observed in the growth of this community that it takes for a creator to be successful on clash? You know, I think for a creator to be successful on clash, there's, there's not, there's not a particular requirement. They just need to, they really just need to be on there and engage back with their fans. We see the the creators that 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 are performing the best or responding to their DMs when they get when they get sent fan mail. They're you know they're liking the comments when people comment on them, um, and they're showing that that fan when that fan gets that moment of recognition. Um, you know it's it, it's really priceless, and that's the thing that uh, we aim to make easy with our platform is is helping the creators understand who their top fans are and helping the creators be able to engage with their fan back with their fans and keep that loop going. So for the aspiring creators out there, where do they go? What do they do if they want to get involved? So it's very, very easy. Uh, the clash is available on iOS and Android. Um, so you can find it, uh, you can go to our website, clashapp.co and their links to, uh, the Android and iOS device are there. Um, there's no barriers to entry. So you can, uh, you can sign up today. You can make a clash account. You can start earning, um, there's a we have a great community of people on the app already. It does work the best if you uh, bring your fans over. So there's uh, you know there's no requirement, but uh, what you want to do is you want to download class, set up your class profile, and then let your fans that where, wherever they are, whatever platforms they are, uh, that that they're here on Clash and that there's um, you know a better opportunity to engage you know with them and and bring 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 over the top fans and. Um, and then create a c- completely separate, segmented, new experience, uh, you know, for your ride or die fans. Well, PJ, I hope I get to the point one day where I've got a community of people that will support me. And if I do, I'll be over on Clash. But uh, thanks for taking some time to explain it all to us. Absolutely. I, it was a pleasure to be on the podcast and I'm um, you know, looking forward to future conversations with you. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast, is presented by my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my monthly newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts,